I have no doubt that we'll have more conversation than we have time, so Happy let's get started. Sure. Um, I, I'm Lois Levine, and I recognize some of you and some of you not, and this is really exciting. Thank you for joining us on this journey. Um, I want to thank everybody at Blue Sky, Molly for coming up with this idea, and Amanda, who is the omnipotent host of this uh, Zoom conference, but also Yu Yang and Demi, who have been instrumental in getting all of this organized. Um, and thank all of you for spending yet more time on your computer screens. So just a few technical matters. Uh, mostly Amanda's gonna keep everybody muted because there are so many people on the call and we're gonna use the hand raise feature um, so that people will have a chance to talk. The idea is for this to definitely be participatory and for me to be uh, facilitating a discussion but not lecturing you guys, for sure. Um, and also we're recording this so that folks who are not able to log in today will be able to uh, access it via um, the web. So just know that you are being recorded. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, that's fine. You don't have to speak up and you don't have to have your video on, but the idea is to share this out. Um, and probably there will be some technical glitches because we've all sat on enough video conferences that they all seem to have technical glitches. So we're going to have patience and humor together. All right, with that said, um, uh, I'm Lois Levine and I often have the pleasure of leading in-person programs either at Blue Sky or at other galleries and museums. And the reason I like to do that is people usually come into the gallery to see what's on the wall, but I like the idea of people coming in to engage with each other. Um, I love when we talk about the works together because I think we're actually building our collective understanding by sharing our ideas with each other. And I really love the idea of building community through engagement with art. So when Molly said to me, well, you know, the gallery is closed, Lois, could we do something online? I thought, oh, that brings up some new goals. Um, one of which is how is our engagement with photography and I know some of you identify as photographers and some are more just uh, viewers and consumers of photography, but in either case, how is our engagement with photography changing based on this really unprecedented moment in which we suddenly find ourselves? Um, and I also wanted to think about what we might do in this format that we wouldn't necessarily do if we were in person. Um, so with that in mind, welcome to our experiment in answering those questions. Um, and I'm gonna start uh, sharing some images and we'll see how lith I am at this. Sorry, not as lith as I want to be. Okay. Um, so this is an image from an in-person, um, one of the in-person programs I've done at uh, Blue Sky. I, I'm the one in the middle in the loud uh, floral print dress, although there are so many fantastic patterns in this picture. I just wanted to put it up for those of you who are visual thinkers, so you could be amazed or horrified at what might be happening in person. But um, as I started to think about this program and really thinking about this question of, do we engage with photography as a documentary object, as a work of art, or both? I thought of this really famous image. If we were all in the same room, I'd say, how many of you recognize this image? And we would see a lot of nodding, and I can't see all of you right now, unfortunately. Um, but this is probably one of the most iconic photographs in America. And I thought of it because, for me, this is one of the first times when I really felt like I am living through a moment in history that people are going to keep thinking about in the future. And that's exactly what this photograph, which is, of course, Dorothea Lange's um, usually called Migrant Mother, photograph from 1936, a Farm Security Administration photo, back when the government responded to a crisis by um, not just wanting to document it, but by paying photographers and other artists to do their craft. It's sort of wonderful to think about it that way. Um, but thinking about what it meant to document that moment through this photograph, and you can see there are some differences between the retouched image on the left and the one on the right. For example, there's that thumb that's very prominent in the lower right uh, corner of the original that gets moved out. Uh, so what does it mean when we manipulate a photograph, are we also being manipulative in what we want the viewer to respond to? Does that take away from the objective work of the documentary photograph? Um, those are kind of some of the questions that we might be engaging with today. 
but also thinking about how what we're living through now might shape our response to this photograph because we are in a moment that is being compared to the Great Depression in terms of the huge economic effects that we're having. Um, so I started off thinking about this image, but then I thought, well, actually this moment is making me think differently about some of the images that I have seen and some of the shows that I've seen at Blue Sky in the past few years. Um, so this is a chance for us to kind of revisit some of those works. And here's the first image that I wanted us to discuss. Um, this is a photograph um, by Cynthia Santos Briones from the Abuelas exhibit that was up sometime in the past couple of years. And everybody just take a few minutes, look at this image, think about some of the things that are striking to you in this image or some of questions that you might have about this image. And I'm gonna give you some time to think about it and then ask you if you have some observations or questions to share, if you would use the raise hand feature and maybe you can paste those directions into the chat again. Um, Amanda, so the people who came in late will see them. Uh, but use that feature and Amanda will be able to tell who's waiting to speak and this is gonna be the wonder of technology working seamlessly, I'm sure. But first take a few minutes just to look. So don't be shy once you have some observations or questions. Use the raise hand feature or else I'm just going to have to randomly call on people, which is very hard because I can't see you. Feel free to chat me if you have any questions about how to do this. Amanda, can you um, tell us some of the folks who've got raised hands, just call on somebody? Ah, here we are. Okay, I would like to call on um, Nolan Straitberger. And Nolan, I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, ready? There we go. I guess the first thing that popped into my mind is I'm, I'm not, like familiar with the background of this image. I've seen it before, but like, is that how she lives? Or is that set up? Okay. So, like, so you have a question, but like with the animals and is it a scene that was set up or is it just documentary? Yeah, that's a great question. And what strikes you most about this picture? Oh, Mother Mary in the background and, um, the stuffed animals, for one, are what pop out to me the most. Why exactly do those stuffed animals pop out to you? They're just unusual. I, I don't know. I, I, it wouldn't be unusual if it was in a child's room, but. Right, so there's this weird incongruity between the figure that we see and the stuffed animals. They're also like super huge stuffed animals. Right. Um, and that uh, there's also some incongruity maybe between the stuffed animals, which seem a little um, impish and fun and the picture of, you said the Virgin Mary, but it's particularly the Virgin of Guadalupe. So, oh. um, so it's a particular cultural as well as religious icon. Yeah, thank you. Are other folks have thoughts? Hi, yes, let's, I would like to call um, next on Sharon Wickham. And Sharon, I'm gonna unmute you in just a second. Oh, thank you for having this meeting and thank you for unmuting me. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sort of fascinated by um, 
also the stuffed animals and also how um, I think people stuff, I mean, have stuffed animals for um, like security and it's, it's also from the past and, and it's from childhood and like people, there's so many people that collect these and, you know, they have them in their cars and maybe not this size, but um, <laughs> she, she looks extremely powerful and, and she's being propped up by her stuffed animals and stuff. And, um, but it is sort of fascinating and, um, you know, when you see a lot of stuffed animals in cars and dashboards and stuff like that. So um, I think there is a security, even though it's not the same as a real animal. Um, so I don't know, but she seems also very powerful and um, content in a way. And I think, you know, stuffed animals can lead, you know, to contentment or that, you know, it's that feeling that fluffy, fur everybody wants that furry, I don't know, it's very tactile. Can you say what about her particular pose that you keep using the word powerful to describe her, what's conveying that? I think, you know, her chin is up. Maybe it's her chin up. Um, you know, she's sitting back in the chair, but there's, you know, it's a direct eye contact. So yeah. there's, you know, it's definitely that. And she's sort of echoing the, the Guadalupe you know, it's just sort of echoing down, I think. It's a cool image. Yeah. Whether it was set up or not, I mean, I could imagine her just having these guys around her house anyway. <laughs> I like that they've now become these guys, like we're in with the posse. <laughs> yeah. uh, other folks have some thoughts or some questions? Yeah, I see um, Brittany Kathy Adams is in the chat. She's got her hand raised. Brittany, I'm gonna unmute you. I just unmuted myself, so <laughs> sorry. So, thank you. <laughs> I've been doing this all day teaching too, so I'm like, I, I got it. <laughs> um, the thing that I wanted to point out is that um, half of me, half of my family is Mexican, and there's the, these markers of things that feel really familiar to my own grandma, um, and it's this formalism of the dress in comparison to the plastic wrapped chair which was like a very common thing in my grandma's household too. It was like beautiful furniture, but also the layer of like plastic that was like, we're not gonna get this dirty. But I like how the photographer in general has this, these things that feel built as a part of the scene, like things that maybe feel pulled in and maybe ask to wear something, but then there's a casual and formal like conflict, but not a conflict, it's just, it is, both at the same time, which I love. Yeah, like there's incongruities in some ways, mm -hmm. but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like it's a tension, right? Like this person seems too old to be playing stuff with stuffed animals, but yet seems perfectly well-placed in the middle of her menagerie. Yeah, and I just love like the comparison of even the fabric, like the textile of the fabric against the plastic. And it feels ill-placed, but at the same time, it feels incredibly believable. Do you mean the plastic of the stuffed animals or the plastic of what she's wearing? The, the chair, actually. Oh, yeah. So the chair is, like, covered in a plastic that she's sitting in. And I love it because she's also wearing some of her best clothes while sitting in a chair that's being protected. And that, there's, like, a funny joke about the markers of, like, a Mexican household. And part of it is like the plastic wrapped furniture, but then that your grandma's always gonna wear like this pristine clothes. And I'm like, yeah, that, that is like pulling a very certain reference too. Yeah, and it's again, interesting to think about the cultural specificity versus more universal, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I, I've spent chunks of childhood in plastic wrapped furniture and mm -hmm. I, I think of it as an immigrant thing. I wouldn't have placed it as, um, Mexican or Mexican-American per se, although again, the Virgin of Guadalupe steers us that way. And if you know Cynthia's work, you know that, that that's who she's photographing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and the, um, there is something about like, that chair is almost a throne, right? That she's seated in, even though it's also wrapped up in plastic. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. 
Yeah, did other folks have other observations? And I guess that the question about, um, uh, Sharon described her as powerful and like, do we, what's our emotional response to the person in this portrait? We have uh, several hands raised. How many more folks do you think we should go through and I'll just list them out so they can be prepared? Uh, let's try at least two more. Okay, wonderful. Um, I would love to hear from Jordan Plonner. It's been a long time since we've seen him. And also Leslie Peltz. Okay, so that means I'm gonna unmute Jordan. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, I was initially struck by how this was clearly a posed photograph, or at least that's my assumption, the way everything is arranged. She obviously has all these things, but she dressed up and posed for this photo. But then, and I had a judgment about that, but then I realized that, that what really strikes me about this photo is that she has the agency in this photo. So much of the documentary photo of the earliest part of last century, the, the people who were being photographed, including the migrant woman, didn't really give permission or have agency. And in fact, we know there's a whole series of photos that were taken of that migrant woman. And the photographer, like any photographer, chooses the one that they want to show. So at the end of the day, it's always the photographer's choice about what of that story they want to tell. And, and But yet you still feel like you know something about that migrant woman. There's some, still some truth there. And even though this photo's staged, you, this woman staged that photo. She decided what dress to wear and how to pose and cross her legs and moved her stuffed animals from different parts of the house so that it was all around her. And you feel like even the pose, you actually know probably more about her than you do about that migrant woman. Her agency is coming through this photograph. You feel like you know more about her for that, that reason. So it's a very interesting aspect of the interplay of the photographer and agency and whether a posed photograph is more or less true um, than an un unposed one. Yeah, and I have some thoughts in response to that, but I know there's one more person waiting, so we'll hear from that person and then I'll kind of wrap in what I was thinking in response to what you shared, Jordan, thanks. Okay, perfect, then in that case, I'm gonna unmute you, Leslie, nice to see you. Hi, um, I was really taken back by the doll. Um, you know, I grew up in a generation, I'm not, I'm not Mexican, I grew up in a generation where uh, my grandmothers and my um, aunts and my mom, everybody had plastic covered furniture. But I remember dolls like that. There would be people like my grandmother used to knit and crochet. And I know I have buried in some boxes with old dolls, costumes that look just like that. And I'm struck here by the fact that the only real color in the room, intense color, are those flowers um, and, this, and this doll. And it, it seems to me that the, the doll makes a statement of something that's very, that was very personal to her rather than, um, rather than the stuffed animals, which are things that she probably acquired. Right, so you've, you've identified this as sort of the moment, there's handicraft in there, um, yes. up, up against everything else that is mass produced even, or maybe especially our icon of the Virgin. Um, and I wanted to tie that back to what Jordan was saying about the, a really interesting point that this is a posed photo, but also one where there's a lot of agency for the subject. And Cynthia in particular, in this, um, set of work, Abuelas, work very closely with her subjects. So these are all women who are, as the title suggests, grandmothers. They're all immigrants from Mexico. And um, so they're elders in their community, but they're also somewhat displaced because they're living in New York um, and their uh, immigration status is, uh, makes them really vulnerable. But she asked them if they would pose in their homes. And so they got to choose what they're wearing, where they're posed in their homes and, and how they're posed. So there's a lot of agency given to them. And that um, even thinking about the composition of this photograph, like you're right, the color of the flowers and the color of the outfit on the doll are so 
they work so well together and that that is um, not necessarily the eye of the photographer, but maybe just the way that people are creating the space that they live in. And I love this photograph and could keep talking about it with you guys for a long time, but I want us to keep moving on and then kind of come back and reflect on the, um, on the work overall. So I'm gonna put up another image and this is by Sarah Bennett, a more recent show uh, that was up at Blue Sky, The Bedroom Project. And again, just take a couple minutes and look at it and think about what strikes you about this image or if you have questions about it. And we can do another round of hand raising so folks can share. And feel free as you're thinking about your comments or questions to either just talk about this picture on its own or in comparison to the last one we saw, whichever is more compelling for you. Um, and Amanda, just let me know when we're starting to get hands up. I can't actually see them from my screen. I will let you know. Come on, folks, give us some hand raises so we can jump into talking about this one or else. Hey, we all of a sudden just got three. So I'm going to call um, first on Chris Rauschenberg, then on Melissa after that. Yeah, so this, this was a show of pictures of women who have been incarcerated and are being out of, out of incarceration in, in their own rooms in various kinds of settings. and. Uh, to, to think about this in terms of your project where everybody feels like, oh, I'm trapped in my room. It's nice to have an image of somebody who has gone from being incarcerated to having a room that's hers to be in. Yeah. Yeah, so it, you, you read it differently when you have the understanding of the whole exhibit um, or the whole uh, body of work that it's from. Who else is on deck, Amanda? Um, let's hear from Melissa Kilgore Marchetti next. Uh, thank you so much for saying my name right. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, the other, the thing that first struck me is that it seemed as if there was a sort of incarceration that was happening in this photograph. I don't know anything about the exhibit. Um, this is my first time with anything with blue sky, so please excuse me. But the fact that her face to me is what was most striking because it's obvious to me that she is looking out of a window with that, that light coming through. And just the idea of I'm looking out of a window, that's what is, I'm reading from this photograph is I'm in a very small place, but I have a window. You know, it's very tidy, it's very compact. Um, so it must be some sort of halfway house is my impression that I got. And the, just the, sereneness of her face as she's I get to gaze out of this window you know um that is that and her dark clothing in comparison to all this light around her these are the things that are striking me yeah I love that you use the word um serene because I do think that there is something part of the reason I chose this picture is that there's something really compelling to me in this person's facial expression and, um, and a, the way that, as you said, it what we're looking at is an interior space, but it is um, implying this exterior space that she's experiencing. And so we're experiencing it through her experience of it, which, as you said, is it's serene. It's really pleasing. Exactly. Uh, other comments or thoughts that folks have about this image? Yeah, next up, let's hear from Kate, and then I'm Sharon Wickham again. Hey, um, I was just going to make a comment on the light. Like, I love the lighting in this image. It's just so bright on her face. It kind of tells a story about what's going on in her head and that contentment that you're talking about, the serenity. 
That's awesome. <laughs> I'm going I'm to push you a little bit on that because there are um, some dark colors. Uh, Melissa noted that the woman herself is wearing dark colors, but there's, there's a lot of um, places where there are dark colors in there. So how does that fit with your... I think your reading the contrasty of the places. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I think the areas with contrast just emphasize the light on her face so much more. And I mean, if you want to push it, you could probably talk about how you know, dark her clothes are in contrast and thinking about, I suppose, what, um, I can't remember his name, but the gentleman said the ex exhibition is about. Right. The prison. Make the prison, I don't know, clothes. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Like we, we often think of prison clothing. This, this might be like dark gray is the new yeah, black. Yeah. Um, although, you know, one of the things that I also find really striking about this image is I think about the blue on the bed quilt and then it, the blue of this maybe a bathrobe or a towel hanging from one of the cupboards. There's some blue in the plastic bins. It looks like maybe there's even a blue shirt on somebody in the picture in the, that's hanging on the wall. And again, this is totally not a posed setting, but I feel like there's this aesthetic running through of the color, which also tells us something about how we create our own space. Uh, you're, you all can see the amount of color that's in my house <laughs> as I'm on video conference with you, but that she's created this space um, where somehow those blues are, are creating a real, a real warmth that goes along with the brightness and kind of a consistency of color that runs through the scene. Um, and did you say Sharon was the next person that we have on deck, Amanda? Oh, yeah. and I, I think yeah. that I see Jenny Baker raising her actual physical hand. <laughs> I was also just about to repost in this chat the instructions on how to raise a hand. So everyone okay. yeah, <laughs> I know how to do that. <laughs> All right. So maybe we'll hear from Sharon and then from, from Jenny. So um, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, this image is so, you know, it's a very small room and there's a kind of a gratefulness in her face, but to me, it, it has everything to do with like our current situation now where, you know, um, you know sort of looking out, um, um, the idea of looking out windows. I think everybody's looking out windows more than usual kind of thing. I don't know, it's just it's this whole, but, it, and there's all this light coming in. So, you know, I don't know, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of, I mean, since I don't know that whole series, but it has a quarantine feel, but uh, be grateful for the light that's there. I don't know, that's just my feeling. Yeah, thank you. Okay, is it my, is it me? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I love her expression so much. Um, so peaceful and with such a sense of hope. It feels like she's really looking toward her future. Um, but the picture on the wall shows something of her past that she brings with her that she's bringing forward because she's, she's put it up on her wall. There's not much decoration, but it's, you know, and the light coming off of that mirror behind her Mm -hmm. means that there's light in her past as well. Like it's a very right. hopeful picture to me um, and very balanced. And, and she's so tidy with all of her belongings up top, but then, you know, the robe and the towels and the everything, it's very in the moment. And in contrast to the last picture where it was so very posed and her arms were crossed and she was sitting in front of doors and blocking them. And in this one, it just feels so much freer in a way. It's, I just, I'm really responding to that. I, I like also the way that you've sort of, um, you, you've pushed us on both a literal reading and a metaphorical reading, right? So on the literal reading, don't forget to look at what, what seems like it's not the center of the photo. It's really easy because of the way the light works and where the figure is and the, contrast between the white background and the dark clothes for our eyes to go right to the figure in here. And I think that that's intentional that Sarah Bennett as the photographer is giving this person 
a huge, again, a huge amount of subjectivity as opposed to the objectification that we were talking about as a, maybe a tradition in documentary photography. Um, but that it's also important for us to notice everything else that's going on to talking about what does it mean to have one image, one photograph on the wall and what import that gives that image. And the way that you said, oh, because there's light in the mirror, that means that there's light in her past too, because it's literally behind her, which is a, um, a much more metaphoric reading of the space, but I think also a useful way for us to think about that relationship between photography as aesthetic art object and photography as documentary object. Um, do we want to keep talking about this one or do we want to go on to yet another image? Yeah, I, uh, okay, it looks like, yeah, let's go to the next image. Okay. Um, so this is another one by Sarah Bennett. And again, just, you know, what are the things that strike you about this image? Um, Nolan's already got his hand raised. Let's jump in with Nolan. All right, Nolan. There we go. I saw this exhibit or exhibition um, at the gallery and I keep seeing it online a lot. It just kind of pops around and it catches my eye every single time. And I, I love looking at these photos. And um, the one thing that I've, I've noticed by looking at the whole body of work that um, and knowing the story that most of these women were incarcerated for like 15 to 25 years or so and this is their life afterwards is even in their freedom how simple they live like and i'm glad these two photos were together because the last uh lady was living out of plastic totes you could see them on the shelves and this lady is too and if you look at the rest of the body of work it's like it's like most of them are just you see that a lot and most of them are just items you know aren't all that important to them you know although in this one we see the furniture right and the furniture is a really warm dark wood it matches the headboard which means that this is you know somebody's got a bedroom set here but i don't think that that I mean, to me, that just raises some questions because you're right, that tote is really prominent and it's clear that that's an important place for belongings. And so I have, I, like, I'm kind of curious about the difference between putting the furniture in the drawers. I'm, fr I'm from Long Island. I always feel like drawers is a word I can't say because of my accent. The drawers um, and putting them in the plastic tote. Uh, yeah. What are some of the other things that strike people about this particular image? And I think also thinking about it either comparing or contrasting to some of the ones we've seen before or just on its own. Mm -hmm. Let's hear next from Vicky and then from Chris Rauschenberg and then from Melissa again. Um, I'm also familiarized with this series and similar to what Nolan was saying, um, a lot of the plastic containers, it's just really fascinating to think the, the decision of still having that, um, like, I guess that, that mentality of the thought of still containing your personal items and trying to hold close to them and not keeping them apart. And in this um, particular photo, um, and also the other one too, with the lighting that we all noticed is that you know, we don't know the, the timeline of how recent they had been released and this photo taken, but just knowing that the windows, the choice of not having blinds and letting light in and, you know, having that, wanting that access, I think that really um, stands out. And I guess also thinking of what we're going through right now, just seeing all these items in containers gives me a little bit of anxiety, but that's what really stood out to me. Yeah. Hey, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, so I remember a long time ago hearing a comedian talk about how when he was a kid, his parents would punish him by sending him to his room. So that was completely stupid. My room is full of all my toys. I love being in my room. If they wanted to punish me, they should have sent me to their room. Anyway, but this woman, unlike the, uh, the Abuela and the last picture, 
she seems the least um, in command in ownership of her space. She seems the most tentative and like, I'm just in this room. And it, she doesn't feel like the queen of the room to me. What gives you that impression? What makes you, gets you to that conclusion? I don't know, something about her expression and body language, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, there is, um, it looks almost like she was caught in speech, right? It, it doesn't feel as, um, which caught in speech would put her more actually interactive with us as the audience and or the photographer, but it, but it does feel like we're less, maybe also it's part of it is that she's off to the side and there's another figure in the, um, in the picture as well, which nobody has talked about, although Eugenia mentioned in the chat the shoes and her daughter's shoes, and I want to know more about what that comment means or hear more about what you guys think about this other figure that's in this particular photograph. Should we hear from Melissa next? <clears throat> uh, so what's what's striking to me is that it does look as if she's caught in the middle of speech. And um, I, I, I've raised three kids. They are always with their face right next to the television. And that's a huge television. Like, to me, that's just humorous because that's what kids do, you know? And um, I've been institutionalized, not in prison, but in terms of working for the federal government. Um, I was in the army. You kind of, Put all the stuff that you really care about in a trunk because you don't know when you're going to move and like if you've been in an institution like a prison it would be many years probably before you felt safe and secure enough to really unpack all your stuff but kids don't feel that way kids their stuff is everywhere all the time and that's kind of what's juxtaposing in here is like it's very neat and orderly except for the kids stuff which is kind of everywhere you know including the kid. <laughs> right, no, I, th those are great observations. I mean, that there's something about, oh, sorry, I ac accidentally went forward. There's something about kid behavior um, that seems, like you said, any, any kid and every kid, but also this idea of how we carry that experience. And I appreciate you drawing this parallel between serving in the military and being imprisoned, obviously really different experiences and people come to them in different ways and come out of them in different ways, but that it that there is a certain mentality about not being in a space that is truly your space for a long period of time and that space being assigned by somebody else. That um, I, I just, it, it, I appreciate how you're helping me think differently about this picture. I mean, that's a, that, that was the first impression that I had about it was like that I do the same thing. I still have stuff in boxes. Yeah. Um, I've been out of the military for 14 years, but just in case, you know. Right, <laughs> right. Something that you do. Right, so there's, there's what we, the, the things that we carry, the spaces that we occupy and the sort of the spaces that are interior to us that we bring with us. And I noticed that somebody um, put in the chat, Ellen put in the chat that there's this question, noticing the shapes of the mirror, of the TV screen, of the window, um, which are all these different shapes, and but they're also all reflecting back in. So in the same moment that we have this notion of like the light from outside, there's also this reflection back into the space. Um, and that there's kind of the, these patterns that emerge because of the bars across the windows and how those get re reflected back. Um, are there other thoughts about this picture? Uh, yes, Bex has something to say. Let me unmute them. Hi, this is Rebecca and Emmanuel at Core IA here. Um, yeah, what we really noticed is um, with the child looking into the TV, how it really created kind of a sense of alienation and not connecting. And in the other two images that we saw, um, the first one was kind of prearranged, but there were things that might have related to the woman's memory or past. And her position of sitting was one of strength. And the last one um, I thought had a sense of hope uh, mm -hmm. with the light on her face as she's looking out of the window and her, her arms were more expansive. And in this one, I, 
I have a sense of isolation, that the woman's very isolated from the child, that the child is not connected to her in this image. Um, and the, and uh, her pose is not really a, a set pose. You know, it's more of a, um, it's not a controlled pose as far as what her hands are, it looks like to me, so. Yeah, she's caught in speech and caught in gesture. And it is yeah. interesting that um, how much we want to read about the relationship between two people based on the one image of them, but that the, this child is, as somebody said, like every kid, your face is up to the screen, you're, you're happy to ignore your uh, parent. Um, but they're also clearly in this really small space together. And we want to know more about that relationship, that there's... Um, that immediately we read somebody differently when they're posed in a photograph with somebody else than we did the other two images, which were women on their own in their space. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, oh, Sharon, Sharon just, um, I think would like to chime in here. So I'm gonna unmute Sharon. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of, I could just wanna go in and decorate the place. I wanna make, it doesn't, she just doesn't feel comfortable. But then I wonder about what were the images that were taken before this exact moment where she is sort of midstream versus the images that would be taken right after that. Um, and then it makes me think once again of quarantine and how do we make ourselves feel comfortable within certain spaces like and how you know sometimes very simple ways to make ourselves feel comfortable and with some people have that knowledge of how to do that and some people don't or never had the chance to or so that's what i i get a little nervous looking at this image i kind of want to help out <laughs> well right although i think some of it is also about her autonomy in the space i mean i that the sheets are um a really bold pattern her pants are a really bold pattern i'm also like i'm somebody who's never this purple cowboy shirt is like the most neutral thing I could think of to wear. Um, oh. So like, I appreciate that her love of patterns is there. I'm pretty sure those might be leopard print shorts that uh, the girl is wearing. And the pink shoes, which you can mm -hmm. imagine um, are often the delight of uh, young children, the pink shoes. So I think that there is some there, but also again, thinking about what it means to have been in spaces that you didn't control and that were so temporary. Right. Um, it might move us forward to the next image, which it takes us back to um, the abuelas. Uh, what are your thoughts about this one? Let's have Chris Rauschenberg start us off. This one, like the first one that we looked at, has a uh, a jungliness to about it. That's you're you're in this city, this concrete, un unnatural place, and recreating, you know, your your home country a little bit by by jungling up the place. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a world of flowers and plants and greenery inside, and not just growing flowers, there are cut flowers, but there are growing plants. Um, but also we get the floral on the tablecloth and the floral on her dress. So this is, as you say, very much the um, exterior and natural world being brought into the interior domestic space. What are other things that strike people about this image? Um, Melissa has her hand up, so I'm gonna call on her and then Jacqueline after that. Thank you. Um, I'm never sure if I'm supposed to unmute or you're unmuting. I apologize. Uh, she looks very proud to me. Um, and, and all the things displayed behind her give me that sense of, of home pride as well. Like these are flowers that she's growing, um, flowers that she's received. There's some handcrafted items behind her. There is this, the, the thing that my eye keeps getting drawn to is this image um, that's hanging on the wall behind her, it has that sense of like, either this is my dream place or a place that I have visited or want to visit. Um, 
Yeah, so that's very striking to me. And the color uh, palette of the tablecloth, wow, that's really striking. And it's playing so well with all the flowers that are behind her. Can you say, when you say striking, what do you, what's striking about it? Well, there's a totally different color uh, profile and some patterning that's not anywhere else except for in the window. So it's like kind of like these things are playing together, but they're opposite at the same time. And was Jacqueline? I just needed Jacqueline. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm really drawn to the textiles um, in this image, even um, kind of towards the top, up above that rectangular um, piece. Like I, I think it's part of the curtain. Yeah, um, I don't know. And something about that is interesting to me. Um, I like this kind of chaotic yet intentional decoration. <laughs> Can you explicate chaotic yet intentional for us? Well, I, was, I think um, I think maybe culture has um, something to do with it. Um, my uh, my family background um, um, is Central American, and you know you you walk into a home, um, and it, it looks very different from like a, an American home. Um, just the type of decoration, um, the way the walls are painted. Um, and so, and, and it, can, it can feel kind of chaotic compared to um, other homes that I've seen um, from my um, like white American friends. Um, but, it's, but it's intentional, uh, if that makes sense. I, um, just kind of, yeah, all the, the flowers, the the craft textiles. I think I even see um, what do they call those uh, uh, crosses used like on Palm Sunday? I think they're in base on like the right or yeah. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm loving this discussion, and uh, but I want to keep us going because I wanted to talk a little bit about why I chose these images. Um, Abuela's is an exhibit that I loved from the moment I saw it at Blue Sky and I got to actually do an in-person event at the gallery where we were reading poetry and talking about some of the photographs. And at the time it struck me that these women, their domestic spaces were really important and powerful to them because they were creating their own worlds, but also because they were really vulnerable in the world outside because of their immigration status. And the difference between a home that is a refuge and a respite, where you are, you know, the queen on her plastic covered throne, or the matriarch surrounded by the flowers that are both what you've cultivated and what's been given to you against the vulnerability of being outside. And certainly, I was conscious of that the first time I saw them. But now as being outside has felt more vulnerable for me, thinking about these images and the way I relate to my home space and to the space outside my home, it just made me wanna come back and think about this exhibit some more. And then pairing that with Sarah Bennett's work, um, which was up in the gallery more recently, but again, lots of striking images for both of these uh, exhibits. It was hard for me to only choose two images for us to talk about, and you can see more of them on the Blue Sky website and on the photographer's own websites. But thinking about what these bedrooms mean to women who have not had control over the space they occupied while they were incarcerated and didn't even necessarily have much control over their bodies and their own auto physical autonomy in that time. And what does it mean to have uh, a bedroom that is a refuge or that is a contrast to what it means to really be incarcerated versus the way many of us have felt, um, especially in the first few weeks of this when we really felt tra trapped at home and we're trying to figure out what it meant to not have our lives outside that we were able to access in the same way. So, and this is one of the things we don't do much in Blue Sky is go back and revisit because there's always so much new work up in the gallery to see and talk about. Revisit some of the previous exhibitions and think about the impact it has on us. But I'm curious about whether any of you guys have similar reflections looking at Abuela's or the Bedroom Project now that might've been different from what you thought when you saw them originally or deepened in some way. 
looks like a Rochelle Delaney had her other hand up before, and I'm wondering if she'd still like a, ch a chance to chime in now. Myself there. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, the uh, woman in the kitchen, I felt like that it was a collaborative effort between uh, the woman and the photographer because I kind of get the sense that maybe this is this woman's needlework and uh, that it was placed on the table and that the, uh, the smaller piece was put on the window. And I think it just reinforces what people say about about their space is that uh, this is this the, the, her obviously her love of flowers uh, from the dress to the tablecloth to the roses and the plants that are growing up along the window that um, <clears throat> it uh, th these are all the things that that she feels very dear about you know that are precious to her. And it's how she set herself up in her home. Yeah. And I just came away with, with that, that um, those were the things that, that she valued. <clears throat> yeah. And really this, um, this, there's also, I just thought of this as you were speaking, like this intimacy of seeing people in their home space, in their bedroom space, which of course is like what we're all doing now. Like, I can all see into your houses, except for those of you who put up fake Zoom backgrounds and you can see into mine. And that's sort of the running gag of this moment is, you know, what does it mean to see your mean boss and then watch their kid like bouncing a ball in the background as you're in the middle of a work conference? Um, Brittany, you've put a fantastic comment in the chat and I'm wondering if I could um, put you on the spot and ask you to share that for folks who aren't following the chat to have uh, Amanda unmute you and see if you would share that. Did I do it? I did it. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still choking. Um, yeah, I, where did it go? Um, I don't remember where I put it. Uh, I wrote something about like, just in watching and half of my family is staying home and staying safe and half of my family is like, very angry about having to stay home. And that's the case with a lot of people who are watching around the country right now. And I I wrote about um, looking at this work during time when people are protesting staying home, <clears throat> that there's a big contrast in the difference of like getting to have a home and having a space that is safe for yourself and how hard so many generations of people have worked to give that to their families or have like overcome like this incarceration to then have a space, even if it's not decorated perfectly, even if it's not like super comfortable yet it's still four walls of safety that's yours <clears throat> and so many of us um in the situation we're in now there's this conflict happening of like not not feeling like that's something that we want to do in contrast to people who are excited to get to do and own something like that yeah and i appreciate you putting in that in the half my family <laughs> feeling this way and half my family's feeling that way because it because it's all understandable I mean mm -hmm. I think we are all on edge we are all wishing we could go back but what does it mean or or what that would be and again that sense of the privilege of space yeah the, the other thing that so I was thinking about these images and how I'm responding to them differently and then I started to think about the space that I've been occupying so I'm going to share some images um, I took this picture in the in my office. So this is the room that I'm in probably uh, more waking time than any place else. Um, and if I said to you what's going on in this picture, you could probably all guess now, right? You can see the stay safe sign, which I put up for people outside my house with all of the little stuffed animals. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because I think if I had showed you this picture six months ago, you wouldn't have any, any idea what was going on. But those signs have become um, for many of us, such a ubiquitous site around our neighborhoods that we all recognize them now. And I suspect that 20 years from now, if you saw this image, you would also be able to locate it exactly in this moment and time, right? So it's thinking about how photography might make me think about my own experience of this time. And this is one image that would do that. And then I thought, well, 
what would another image be? And uh, this is a little too much information about me, but don't worry, we're gonna get back to the rest of you in a moment. Um, very early on in all of this, for reasons I can't quite explain, my partner and I decided that what we needed to hoard was not toilet paper, but hot cereal, that we wanted to feel like we could wake up in the morning and have the comfort of hot cereal. And so we went down to Bob's Red Mill. For those of you who aren't in the Portland area, there is a real Red Mill that Bob has or used to have, um, and you can buy all the products there. And we bought a ton of hot cereal in bulk. And so if I had showed you this image, you wouldn't necessarily associate it with this moment. Although for me, this will always be very much an image that captures the particular moment we're living in. Which leads me to this question. What photograph could you take right now inside whatever place you're in to document some aspect of how you have been experiencing the pandemic? Um, and we wanted to invite you if you would like to actually go take that image right now. So why don't we take a couple minutes, but don't not come back. Just take a couple minutes, find your image, take your image. And then we'll be back in like two minutes. I feel like we need to have the Jeopardy countdown going right now. Do, 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 it's true, we did not think of that background music for this part. If I had a photograph of you, what's something to remind me? And now I'm like madly uh, looking around through the images to see who's actually, some folks have gotten up to go take their pictures. Like be a tippet in the light. And for those of you who've taken a picture, if you have the ability to put it on the device that you are on this Zoom meeting on, then we're gonna invite you to screen share. But we didn't wanna make it too much of a high pressure situation. How about this? If you take your picture and upload it to your desktop, then, oh, look at that. Leslie already did it. So Leslie, can you tell us why this image? My husband died on March 1st, and mm. it was not from, the, um, from COVID. It was a shock and completely unexpected. And the thing that has, the hardest thing to me that during all these weeks has been the, um, the aloneness and we were married 52 years, so it's a very empty bed. Oh, thank you for sharing that really personal observation. And it is like, it, it, I know a number of people who have lost partners or other family members in this time and the strangeness of grief in this particular way. Are there other folks who have images they want to share? Looks like Kate uploaded one to the group chat, and Kate, I'm wondering if you can do a screen share for us. And if you need a hint on that, if you go to the, at least on my device, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a big green button that says share screen. If not, I, oh, no, there it is. I think I can share it from here. That's Kate's image, yes? So Kate, do you wanna tell us why this is the one you took? Sorry, I'm terrible with technology. 
it's all right. <laughs> um, this is a very quick image I took of my bed in my hostel that I'm staying at um, in Guatemala, where I've been stuck for the last three months. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's um, I think actually it's interesting. If I had to choose one image, it would be this little box because I think it's probably where I've spent most of my time. The hostel is lovely and the city I'm in is lovely, but I think this is kind of, that got that comfort and safety about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it does. It feels like a bed that I want to snuggle in, but it also, <laughs> like, boy, that ceiling seems very low over the top of the bed. Yeah, it's just a little cube with a mattress in it. It's great. Thank you. How do I unshare my screen? I think I just shared it so that folks got to see it, yes? It was up, right, Amanda? Yes, it was. Um, and next up, we have um, someone we haven't heard from yet. We have Jay Cosnet and then Nolan after that. Okay, and then I'm going to take us to the next activity. So everybody else, I'm excited, but, but hold on. So is Jay going to screen share? Yes, I think I, I'm trying to here. I got two screens. Let's see if this works. Whoops, that's not it. Wrong screen. Here, let's do it this way. There we go. So this image, I actually didn't take this just now. I took this last night. Um, and it, I, have, I have more screens than I've ever had in my life in one place as a result of this because I have my work computer, I have my own computer, I have my TV. Um, and this shows me doing something that I've never needed to do before, which is put together uh, videos of individual musicians into a collaborative performance, um, which those of you who attend the Low Bar Chorale might know about. And this was me working on this uh, a couple nights ago. Um, this will always take me back to this moment. Um, right, Jay, Jay used to have one role in this community chorale and now has become the person who edits all the videos of the musicians who can't be in one space to share. And um, who is the next person that you had on deck, Amanda? Uh, that would be Nolan Straightburger. All right. We can do it now. I just hit share screen here. Yep. Yes. We're, and we're amazingly trusting that you guys aren't going to share anything naughty. <laughs> All right. Oh, I guess it's a little blurry, but it's one I just took. Can you see it? I'm I'm not familiar with Zoom that well, so. Yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Um, so our life has changed significantly since this, and anybody with with a child probably well, I mean everybody's has, but even more so with with a child because I went from, you know, she went from public school to being homeschooled. And so our school district sent out all these workbooks and stuff. And uh, this has been her education for the last, what, 65 days or so, yeah. is, are these work workbooks. So. Um, and who's the little furry friend next to the workbook? That's her, it's, that's Mr. White Bear. She's had that forever. And it was just laying there. I mean, so he, he hangs out with us everywhere. And uh, he must have been hanging out with us you know, while we were doing this, doing our homework assignments. And then, uh, yeah, in a blue glove, she was doing arts and crafts with, making Barbie dresses, or I don't know what she was doing with that, but. That's a great picture. Thank you all for sharing these images. And so I'm gonna, can you unshare, Nolan? Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks. And that was just taken right now. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, I really appreciate it uh, and getting to look into everybody's life. So thank you for doing that very quickly and on the fly. And I'm happy to say we have a more organized way that we're going to invite you um, into this. Um, so I'm going to go back and share my screen again. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Portland Grid Project. Uh, which is not a blue sky venture, but is sort of a, a friend of blue sky. And um, it's a bunch of work by photographers who basically divided up the city into a grid and have taken pictures over time. And 
we're a little bit, we're a little bit, we've gone long, so I'm gonna talk through this a little bit quickly. Um, so if you don't know the Portland Grid Project, you can go to any grid, I've chosen the square that I happen to live in, and look at the images that were taken in different years. So you see here three images by three different photographers from really vast different time periods, but they're interesting documents of the city because you can see how neighborhoods have changed, particularly ones that have gentrified or businesses that have disappeared. Sometimes you look through and you recognize something that you forgot you ever knew about or you see somebody that you know. Um, but I was thinking, well, maybe it's a good moment for us to think about documenting whatever space we're in now. And I know not everybody in this program is in Portland. So we wanted to invite you to do just that, to think about photography as your lens for the pandemic and the pandemic as your lens for photography. And as we all just proved, you don't have to set things up in advance and you don't have to be a professional photographer um, to be documenting what's going on right now. So between now and the end of the month, we're inviting you to document some aspect of life as it is affected by the pandemic and the stay at home order. And this is happening at an interesting moment because in some places things are opening up and in other places not. Um, so you could choose a particular theme, the marquees of closed theaters and houses of worship, lines of people when you get into stores, shelves that show what people, what sold out because people stockpiled it, the different types of face masks people are wearing, don't get closer than six feet. You know, whatever you think is your theme, and you could also choose something that might be a little bit more abstract, right? You could pick a particular color and just look for it each day, or you could take the idea of six feet and, only photograph images that are exactly six feet from you as the photographer, or you could do anything you want because this is not dictatorial, it's just an invitation. Um, and you can take as many photographs as you like and there's not a need to share them, but we are inviting you if you would like to share them, in which case we'd ask you to choose 10. And again, you have from now until the end of the month and just save them as JPEGs with the file that's like your first name, your last name and the photo number. So mine would be Lois Levine 1 through Lois Levine 10. And then there's a place to which you can upload them. And our next session to do one of these programs is June 3rd. Um, and Amanda, can you actually put this information in the chat for folks? Yes. So we've got- a, I did a screenshot of it. Awesome. We, we've got a PDF with the information that Amanda is gonna share and you can download the file, but we'll also send it out in an email to everybody who registered for this. But here's the secret, anybody can do this. So if you have friends, loved ones, mere acquaintances, uh, who you think might be interested in doing this who are not part of the session today, they also can do it. So please feel free when you have the information to share it out, because what we really wanna do is make this invitation as big as possible. And next time, this is what we will come together to talk about. Um, so I think I can stop sharing now. So that was like all I prepared. And I know that some people are Zoomed out because they're on Zoom all day, every day, and you can't wait to not be on Zoom. But um, thank you for this conversation. It was exactly what I always hope these programs are, which was that it deepens my appreciation of the work because I got to hear what you think. And I feel like we connected with people who we don't necessarily know in person and who are all over the place. So thank you. And maybe um, we can do a little like quick thing where we unmute everybody and everybody gets to sort of make some noise and then we can remute everybody, but anybody who wants to stick around and keep the conversation going, we can do that. We can go back and look at some of the other images and people who want to politely get the hell off Zoom for the day can also do that. But Amanda, will you un unmute us so we can all make some noise together? Yeah. 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 Yeah.